Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this inaugural event for us. My name is Chris Magnuson, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. And I just want to issue a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. This is the launch of our Innovation in Education, the Smolik Engagement Series. Uh, and we're very, very excited. I would like to acknowledge uh, the Seelix uh, peoples on whose traditional territory uh, we are privileged to gather and to also invite Pamela Barnes from the West Bank First Nations to come and offer some words of welcome. Pamela. I'm Esquise Chuchawaskit. My given name is Pamela Barnes. My ancestral name is Chuchawaskit, which means the coming of a storm or the coming of change. I am a member of the Seelks people from West Bank First Nation, and I'd like to um, welcome all of you here. I'd like to share with you a little bit about our lands and how we see our lands. Our lands are very sacred to us. And we don't see ourselves as owners of these lands. We're more like, um, we hold these lands more like in trust. We see these lands as borrowed from our great, 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 great grandchildren. And whenever you borrow something, the premise is that you leave it or return it in better condition if you can, and at the very least, in as good of condition as how you find it. And it's with that understanding that we welcomed people to these lands and to share these lands with us. It's also um, important for us to note that we haven't done a very good job of late with that trust that we all have for the future. And so just a gentle reminder to think about um, how it is that we walk on these lands, how we live on these lands. I'll give you a quick um, language lesson. Um, the lake, of course, is famous for... Pogo Pogo. Which is a nickname that's been around for a, since about 1924. In our language, it's Nahaha'i. And Nahaha'i is a sacred water being and reminds us, again, that that lake does not belong to us. That lake is Nahaha'i's home. So when we go into the lake or around the lake, we remember that we're going into someone else's home. And we need to do that in the spirit that, we that you would do that. and um, honor that when you go into someone else's home that is expected. So with that, I, I welcome you all to our traditional territory and hope that you have a great experience while you're here and have a great evening. Thank you so much. You can always tell a good educator, right? Because you learn something in like two minutes. You learn something you never knew before. So thank you very much. Um, it's really my privilege to welcome you to this uh, newly opened innovation center. What a, what a wonderful facility this is. A hub of innovation and technology and creativity right here in the heart of Kelowna. And I'm going to ask uh, Steve Wandler to come up and uh, give a more formal welcome uh, and a few opening remarks. Uh, Steve, as you know, is the co-founder of Fresh Grade, uh, an Okanagan Valley su uh, tech su success story. I came to know Steve because his work, uh, the platforms that they developed for Fresh Grade, the software, formed the basis uh, for an exciting and innovative project in the Surrey School District that was the first winner of the Smolik Award. And since then, I've been very fortunate to have Steve uh, sit on the uh, Deans of Dean of Education Advisory Council, 
uh, and he's just been an amazing source of support and inspiration uh, to the work that we do. We greatly value his commitment to education in all its forms and all of its all of its places. So, Steve, would you please come forward and give us a little bit? I have ADHD. I can't stand still, so I'm going to take the mic. <clears throat> um, thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure working with SFU and. Um, and the work that they're doing uh, around innovation and education. And you know, we've had several conversations here tonight about innovation, and I actually asked Leighton, where's Leighton? Somewhere, oh, there he, right there. Um, what does innovation mean to him, and what is innovation in general? And you know, when we talk about innovation and education, often, uh, while I travel, it often comes around to technology. And to me, it's not about technology. It's really about how do we move the conversation forward of growth for students around education and what does that actually look like. And my journey uh, through fresh grade has uh, really cemented in that what we're doing in British Columbia is um, we should be proud of. Um, where my travels around the world around education, um, we're doing amazing things here. And, uh, and we're leading the pack, but we, of course, need to move faster in, in those things. We can't stand still, and we need to innovate faster, which is you know, a big part of why I'm glad that you're here in this building, because that's the purpose of why we built the Innovation Center and why we have partners in the Innovation Center like UBCO and, um, and Accelerate Okanagan and uh, all kinds of other companies. We even have a yoga studio in here um, you know, which you know has to do with mental health and, and innovation. And uh, just to give you a little background of where this building came from, if some of you don't know, I think it was, Jason, how long ago was it when we were in that room? You were in that room, right? It, and Regwa was there too. Um, I think it was seven years ago, six or seven years ago. We sat in a room in a lawyer's boardroom and we brought all these people from around the Okanagan uh, we brought politicians, uh, you know, mayors, MLAs, MPs, uh, business leaders, uh, thought leaders, everyone from the community, and we put them into a room and we said, what do we want the Okanagan to be and what do we want, uh, what is the next step for us and what, it, what does that look like? And, and we came up with three ideas of what that was, people, place, and something else. <laughs> Can't remember. Booze. Booze. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and it came down to you know, attracting good t people and talent, but also a place, a central place that we can actually come and gather and have these types of conversations. And that's where the Innovation Center uh, landed. So this is our, your space, it's a community space, and I think we need to be thankful or, or and, and not just thankful, actually use it for that, um, is making sure that we collaborate and come together to solve these big problems that um, I don't think we're moving fast enough on. And to your point, it's uh, using and doing what we think, or doing the right thing for our land and for our people and our, for our community, we need to do, we need to do that more and faster. And you guys are here because you're leaders in that. And so nobody's gonna do it. Nobody else is gonna do it. We gotta do it. And you know the government's not just going to show up one day and just say, "Here you go, it's all done for you." Uh, we got to do that as innovators. So uh, welcome you on that journey. I thank you, Chris, for coming and being a part of the community. You're now officially part of the community, and uh, look forward to having you back. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Of course, ADHD means something different in his world. Uh, an astute deliverer of humane development is what I think it, uh, <laughs> that really stands for. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize a few special guests that are in the room. Uh, we'll start with uh, Russ Smolik. Russ, if you could wave. Um, Russ is the uh, donor behind this amazing uh, prize that we're celebrating this evening. Um, we have uh, Ragwa Gopal, the uh, uh, CEO of Accelerate Okanagan. Where did he get to? Went to the washroom. 
Um, we have our featured speaker tonight, Peter Liliadal, our moderator, Milt McLaren, for the panel coming up later, and some absolutely amazing innovators sitting on a panel that you're going to meet in just a few minutes. So on, on behalf of the Faculty of Education of SFU, I'm pleased that you could all join us uh, for this launch of our innovation uh, in education, the Smallic Engagement Series. Uh, our goal really is, as, as Steve mentioned, um, to showcase some of the amazing and wonderful work that goes on in this province. And educators being educators, they're usually the last person or the last group to blow their own horn. And we want to find better ways to celebrate and acknowledge all this amazing, amazing work. Uh, the work that we do in BC really is world known. It leads the world in so many different areas. Uh, I had the, I don't know if it was pleasure at the time, I was co-chair of the advisory group on provincial assessment and coming up with recommendations for what assessment should look like. And after the report was released, I received a call uh, from a gentleman from Korea, and he was the head of the National Korean Assessment Branch. And he wanted to hear about the work we were doing around the assessment. And I said, why in the world did you be coming to BC? At the time, Korea was second, I think, uh, Finland number one, and then Korea or Singapore would be second and third uh, in the world in achievement standards. And he said, yes, but our children are not happy and we want to know how BC achieves such excellent results and still has children who are happy. And I thought that was a pretty strong testament to the quality and the character of, of education in BC. So tonight, we have educators, innovators, entrepreneurs, and community leaders from uh, throughout the Okanagan Corridor, and I'm proud to say many of whom are uh, SFU alumni. But I also want to acknowledge, as we've acknowledged the traditional territories that we are on, um, I want to acknowledge the absolutely wonderful work that the Faculty of Education at UBC Okanagan uh, is doing in their teacher education program, and to also acknowledge the spirit of collaboration that exists amongst teacher education programs around this province. It really is quite exceptional. On to the Smolik Prize. Um, the Smolik Prize was endowed to the Faculty of Education uh, and made possible through the, a really a generous gift from Russ and Ellen Smolik, uh, who are longtime supporters of SFU, but who are longtime passionate and committed to uh, education. Uh, and unfortunately, Ellen is not able to be with us tonight. Um, but you have to hear a little bit about where the heart of the educator lies within the Smoliks. They have this fabulous trip that they were doing where they would travel through some, I call them the stands. Um, they started on the, uh, the coast of China and drove their way uh, uh, right through to India, I believe. And uh, after three weeks of driving, they'd leave their vehicle in whatever little village they happened to be in and fly home. Uh, and all along that trip, uh, every day, as much as they could, they made sure they visited schools to see what schools look like uh, in those, those parts of the world. Um, so from not just being curious, but just being passionate about quality education, when they returned, they came to realize that we have a very, very fine system of education here. But despite how fortunate we are in BC to have such a fine quality of education, they also believe that we can do better, and we must do better. We can't rest on our laurels. We must be pushing the envelope. We must be pushing for innovation, so we maintain that leading place. And so the Smolik Prize is intended to recognize people who have developed and implemented an innovation, an invention, a process, or some sort of intervention that significantly and demonstrably enhances educational practice in the K-12 public school system in BC. We've been long recognized at SFU as being an innovator in education, and the Smolik Prize is the premier award in Canada for recognizing innovation in K-12 education. So I want to thank Russ. Um, I also want to uh, thank Ellen in her absence for your dedication and for sharing your love of learning in such an important and tangible way. So tonight's inaugural innovation and in education event 
proudly showcases educators who are leading BC and the world in educational innovation. You will meet some of these innovators later as they share a panel on exciting new developments in K-12 education. And we hope that you will come away from this event both proud and inspired. Proud to be a part of this wonderful community of educators and inspired to connect with them or perhaps to even be the next Smolik innovator. And that brings us to the main event for the evening. The 2017 Smolik Prize was awarded to Dr. Peter Liliodal for his inspiring work called Building Thinking Classrooms. He describes nine essential empirically supported practices that mathematics teachers can use to foster collaborative mathematics learning and deeper understanding. And it is now my pleasure to invite our featured speaker, the, or the 2017 Smolik Prize winner, our faculty's own Peter Liliodal. Uh, I got it. Thank you, Chris. I think that's one of the events. This is going to be one of those events where the introduction is better than the presentation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so thank you, Chris, for that. And thank you to uh, Russ and, and the Smolics for their generous donation and their, their, their undying support for education in BC. Um, what an amazing venue. And I also want to thank all the SFU alum who have come out to this, to this event. I'll try not to disappoint. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the building thinking classrooms and, um, and what, what it's meant to me and where it's come from and, and the impact it's had on education in BC and across Canada. Fifteen years ago, I, was, I spent a week in a middle school classroom in the Lower Mainland trying to help a grade 7, 8 teacher implement problem solving in her math lessons. It was an unmitigated disaster. Every day was worse than the day before. It just, we were just spiraling into agony. After a week of, of working with Jane, trying to get this to work well, I spent three more days in her classroom, observing what her classroom looks like when we're not trying to disrupt the norms. And I started to get an inkling of what was going on. So I left her room, and for the next several months, I visited 40 classrooms in the Lower Mainland. And, and I would spend sometimes a whole day in a single classroom. Sometimes I would visit more than one in one day. And, and in my journeys in these classrooms, I, I, I came across three for me, powerful realizations. The first realization was that it didn't seem to matter whether I was in an elementary school or a secondary school. It didn't seem to matter if I was in a low socioeconomic setting or a high socioeconomic setting or in a private school or in a public school. Everywhere I went, I saw students not thinking. The second realization was that the teachers I was observing were caught in a cycle where that because the students weren't thinking, they were forced to plan their teaching on the assumption that students either couldn't or wouldn't think. So they were caught in this vicious cycle. Um, the other thing I realized was <clears throat> it didn't really matter where I went. Classrooms looked more alike than they looked different. Yes, there were differences, but the differences, when you strip away the surface veneer of it, fundamentally, classrooms were more alike than they were different. And the activities that happened in classrooms, irrespective of those differences, was more alike than they were different. And it turns out that those things that are common in all classrooms have been common in classrooms for a very long time. So I had this conjecture, and the conjecture was that maybe this vicious cycle that the teachers are trapped in, where students won't think or aren't thinking, and forcing them to plan their teaching on the assumption that the students can't or won't think, is somehow linked 
to the fact that we have what I've come to call institutional norms. In education, we often talk about classroom norms. Classroom norms are the, the practices that take in a shared understandings that happen in a classroom, but it goes well beyond that because when you see this kind of similarities between classrooms, between generations, between countries that I saw in my journeys, it speaks to something greater than a classroom norm. Institutionally normative structures are sort of pushing down in subtle and unspoken ways and causing teachers and schools to organize their classrooms and their classroom practices in a particular way. And in many ways, these, these, these norms are non-negotiated. The teachers I'm dealing with don't really feel like they've been told they have to do it that way, but at the same time, they don't really feel like they've had a choice in doing it any different way. So I started to think maybe these things are related. Maybe the institutional norms, these non-negotiated norms, are connected to this vicious cycle I'm seeing. So I started on a quest, on a journey to try to figure out if this is true, and if it is, if I could change it in some way. So I recruited, over the 15-year span, over 400 teachers to work with me in small ways to make changes in pedagogy and in normative structures in classrooms to see if it can have an impact on the student thinking and student engagement. For the most part, we worked in two-week cycles. And our goal was to renegotiate those non-negotiated norms. We were willing to try anything, and we weren't willing to take anything for granted. Nothing was untouchable. We had two mandates. The first mandate was, whatever it is we were doing had to somehow improve student thinking. <clears throat> increase student thinking. The second mandate was it had to be things teachers were willing to do. So for example, I worked with eight teachers in Edmonton and we taught for two weeks in classrooms with no furniture in them. That was, we were disrupting the institutionally normative structures. It had an impact, students were more engaged. They did more thinking. But it turns out teachers aren't really willing to teach in classrooms with no furniture in them. So it, it didn't make the list. Um, <clears throat> so we chipped away at this slowly. And Chris mentioned that there was nine tools that emerged. And in the last year, even, there's been more tools that have taken form. But what we did was we managed to dissect a classroom lesson into 14 moments, things that happen in the lesson. And each of these moments provides us with an opportunity to have students think or not. And over time, what we started to find was optimal practices for thinking. Now, I have to just qualify optimal here. Optimal within the scope of what we were able to imagine and what we were able to execute. So I make no claim that this is universally optimal, but this was optimal within our problem space. And what emerged were 14 tools that have radically changed the way classrooms look. The way the teacher is within this space and the way the students interact with each other and with curriculum within this space. And the way students interact with each other within this space. The way teachers give a lesson, the way students take notes and do homework, and the ways in which students write tests. And it's, true, and it's made the jump from mathematics to now having, I now have work with teachers who are operationalizing this in every subject, in every grade, in pretty much every province in the country. Social studies class. Grade eight English class, that's me. There's a school in Ottawa. The framework <clears throat> was more than just a collection of 14 tools, however, because when we started experimenting with how to implement these tools in sequence, how to bring about change for a teacher, for a classroom, 
these tools organize themselves into a, into a sort of a hierarchy of four toolkits. For a new teacher to try to implement, and for an experienced teacher to try to implement, And it started taking on a life of its own. Somewhere along the way, it started uh, trending on Twitter with the hashtag VNPS. I have no idea where this school, oh, it's in Winnipeg. Or VRG, visibly random groups, vertically non-permanent surfaces. Or thinking classrooms. Last Friday, I was a keynote at the biggest math education conference in the country in Ontario. And thinking classroom has become such a norm in that province that when you get to choose the technology you need for your presentation, thinking classroom was one of the options. And it had actually become a sticker at the conference. And we're starting to see people putting out examples of what their classrooms look like. They're innovating within these spaces. So there, this is an entire lesson of advanced functions in Ontario. Students are heading for university next year. They have very short blocks there, so they have to teach very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So this is a fundamentally different looking classroom. We're operating inside of the norms of a school, but we've redesigned and repurposed pretty much every moment within that space to have students engaged for 80 minutes consecutively. I've been working a lot across the country and around the world and with this comes a number of publications that are coming out. The ones I'm the most proud of are the master's students who are doing theses on this. The latest one, which was just defended on Monday, Maria Kirchhoff, who used the Thinking Classroom framework, and in 18 days had her grade 10 students cover the entire curriculum of a Math 10 course. But I've been busy. So in BC, I've worked with 17 different school districts implementing this within the district. Intensive work, usually with 30 teachers at a time, multiple visits. Chris knows I'm away often. And we're seeing some amazing things happening in the Okanagan Valley. I'm in Vernon next week, working with teachers there for the third time this year. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Under 15. Abrupt endings are what happens when we do the enforced time finish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Um, a, a wonderful overview of something that's potentially uh, truly transformative uh, for education not only in BC, but uh, throughout Canada and around the world. Um, I'm going to invite Milt McLaren now to uh, come up and introduce tonight's panelists. Uh, Milt is an emeritus professor of education at SFU. Uh, he's had a very long-standing interest in environmental education, and he's been involved with the development of educational systems since, well, <laughs> it's, it's been a while. Um, Milt has won many awards in his, in his path. Uh, he's taught and supervised uh, around 36 million graduate students in education. Um, he's also a very valued member of the Dean's Education Advisory Council um, and has been extremely supportive and instrumental in supporting this event. So Milt, would you like to please come forward and introduce our panel of innovators for tonight?
wonderful presentation. Can you hear me out there? This thing kind of dead coming back this way. Uh, and also, uh, it was interesting to call him up here again and we'll talk some more. Well, let me say it's a pleasure um, to be here this evening because there are a number of familiar faces in this room. Uh, I'm kind of an honorary colonian. You have to live here a lot of years before you actually get to be one. Close yet. My wife has got a lot more legitimacy in that department than I have. Um, but boy, um, it's great to see people here who um, have been involved with SFU over many years. SFU has a, a long history in this valley. Uh, we had teacher education sites in Salmon Arm, in Vernon, in Kelowna, in Penticton, and over into Cranbrook, and up into uh, Dawson Creek, and Terrace as well. So. Uh, a lot of traveling in those days to our sites, but um, one of our favorites was the first site for offshore, off-campus uh, teacher education was in Vernon, and it was the old yacht club, clubhouse on Kalamaka Lake. Boy, that was a real plum. It was a beautiful place. What Stephen Leacock said universities should be like, deep armchairs, cigars, and good brandy. They didn't have the cigars, but there was some brandy from time to time. Anyway, it is my pleasure this evening uh, to have uh, a panel. Um, we've talked a bit about the panel, and uh, I know that's our desire that we will make this uh, fairly free-flowing and um, invite interaction with the with the. Uh, I'd also like to say that um, the other thing I want to mention about this is again a, a follow-up on the on the Smolik Prize, and I would call your attention to the poster over in the corner there, and again, acknowledge how wonderful it is uh, to have the Smolik um, family have provided this incentive towards innovation. Uh, uh, to have that kind of in, 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 inspiration uh, maybe more common in areas of high technology and so on, but to see the kind of things that Peter was doing in those classrooms, that's, uh, that's inspiring. So if I could call on the members of the panel to come up, I'll introduce you. There. You have a nice row of chairs, but don't feel that you have to uh, sit in a rigid line if you don't like to. Steve, I'm not going to introduce you again. Chris has already lauded you, but we'll get back to that. Uh, so, uh, Corrine McWinney. Corrine. Uh, Corrine is Innovations Coordinator with the Vernon School District. Um, your good friend Susan Crichton had interesting things to say about you last week. And um, Corrine and her team made the Smolik Prize honor roll in 2017 their work on the mobile makerspace, so I know we'll, we'll hear more about that. Well, um, Todd Manuel is Assistant Superintendent, it's Todd, um, and Judith King, Judith, um, Judith is, Todd is Assistant Superintendent, and Judith King is helping teacher both from the Okanagan and Skaha School District, um, and their team um, is uh, called Through a Different Lens, to recognize that I think you were both on the honor roll for the Smolik Prize too, were you not? Yes, I remember I was at that award. And uh, along with them, uh, Leighton Schnellert. Leighton, you're here, you're in the audience. Also part of the Through a Different Lens. And then Steve Wandler, uh, we have mentioned. We'll hear more from Steve. We won't let you off so easy. So, um, when we were talking about this, um, we have wonderful program assistants in the Faculty of Education. And 
they said, Milt, we'd like you to work up some questions for the panel. And I think, what, you gave me 24 hours in order to do that. Actually, 12, I think it was. That <laughs> yeah, was it, yeah. And so I got thinking about some interesting things to have the panel talk about. Uh, and I made one list, and I looked at it and thought, it's far too stuffy. And uh, it reminded me of too much stuff that I'm doing with graduate students right now. So I said, um, so what I'd like to do is, and we can do this, we don't have to do this up and down the rows and the chair. So I'll, I'll drop the question out here, and then I'll let you two. Let me start with this. Steve, you actually got me thinking about this. As every person that I know that I characterize as an innovator has a reason, something, a head scratcher that got them going on the project. So if you think of Fresh Grade and your work with Fresh Grade, and with this Innovation Center now, and the rest of, of the panelists, I know that you are all people who at some point said, you know, we should do this. We should have something, we should, we should start here on this. And we don't very often ask people, so what, what were the head scratchers? What were the sort of lump under the mattresses that made you start moving in this direction? And there are people in this room whose work I know also who are innovators like that. And I, I remember some of the things that got them going. So any of you who would like to speak to that, I think it would be interesting. I'm, no, I'm not shy to take the <laughs> microphone. Um, Started fresh grade seven years ago, and I think our why, or my why, anyways, was um, it's funny actually because I sit on the advisory board of Simon Fraser University, and I didn't graduate from high school. And um, um, oh, Google just said something to me. Sorry, I must have um, ADHD. Remember, uh, but I was uh, challenged with the fact that. Um, I was told four times a year for 11 years that I was not good at what I did. And that frustrated me a lot. I dropped out of school and I left and became an entrepreneur. And I have a, 12, I have a 19 year old daughter and a, uh, who's in UBC. And um, I have a 12 year old son that struggles in school and is constantly being told that he's not good at school. And uh, that ticked me off. I could say other things, but it ticked me off. And, and I'm not a believer that grades define who you are as a learner. And I think that we need a better way of being able to show what you're good at and how your growth, what growth looks like in a learner and not discourage our kids around grades because we do that every single day. And uh, so I've made that my mission is to change the way that we uh, recognize what good looks like in school. And I think report cards suck. And I think we waste time on things that don't matter around reporting. And I think there's just a better way of doing that. And over 100 years, we have not changed the way we've reported in school. But yet, I know what a distant, not so good friend that I knew in 11th grade is doing on a beach in Mexico this minute. So I think that's a shame, and we need to change that. Uh, I guess the moment f uh, for me was uh, a few years ago was when we started this project. And um, actually, sitting in the seat here, and when we said we had a panel of innovators, and I sort of wondered when I became an innovator. Um, because I always just, I, I was just, I'm a curious person, and I'm, I just think of myself as a lifelong learner, and I'm always trying to do things differently. And I think now we call that an innovator. So it was, I sort of had a moment there, and I thought, when did I become an innovator? <laughs> um, but uh, for me, um, I came into a role where I've always sort of been passionate about technology and always sort of embedded technology in my teaching. Uh, and so I sort of got a tap on her shoulder at the district, and, and they said, you know, would you be willing to take on this type of a position at the district? And uh, at that time, I was really into, very passionate about making and creating and, and finding different ways of learning for those students who can't sit still and can't, we need those hands-on opportunities. And uh, I actually thought, well, I'm more passionate about just the making with, like, cardboard and pipe cleaners and tape and glue and now all of a sudden I have to bring in technology 
because that's my job, right? So I had to find a creative way of, of doing that. And I think that sort of um, where our project came from in that moment was how do we take technology, how do we take creative uh, learning and creative thinking and doing things a different way. And that's kind of what, where my project was inspired from. Well, I'll, I'll just talk quickly about um, my experience starting in education was an alternative education, an alternate school. And it struck me quickly that we, we fund our schools based on deficits. And yet those students I worked with and the relationships I built were incredibly meaningful for me. And you saw all these strengths in these kids. And it made me wonder, how do we embrace those strengths in a different way? How do we shine a light on things that schools haven't traditionally been able to shine a light on for those students so that we don't lose them and they feel like they're valued and that those other skills outside of what we've traditionally done in schools can be embraced? And so looking around at other educators and ways of doing things differently has always been sort of where I've started my thinking around uh, um, moving education forward. And I'd also be the first to say that I've never come up with a good idea on my own, but I think that I've been able to come up with some great ideas collaboratively, and that's where working with Judith, working with Layton, working with Naren Searcy, uh, Myron Duick, others in our district, we've been able to put together some really innovative projects, and we keep coming back to that and reflecting on that and trying to move forward. Uh, for me, it is because of Steve that our project started. He doesn't know that, but um, so I've been in education for 40 years, and I went in because I worked with five girls who um, were in those days were called juvenile delinquents, who were very smart and who were all failing school. And uh, so for 40 years, the dream has been to change the institution to be open to all kids and all the gifts that they bring. And kids bring different gifts. And um, so my, uh, for the last eight years and through a different lens, it's been looking at how do we find ways for kids to show their gifts besides the traditional testing, writing essays, reading, and so that you end up with kids who think they're not bright but they really are incredibly bright, and they start things like fresh grade. Um, but in school, they're told they're not successful, they're not OK, they're not learners. And so how do we change that? How do we give them a different message? So Through a Different Lens has been an incredible project to uh, help educators begin to see kids differently. So, um one of the things that we've been talking about the whole evening is centered around it is this word innovation. I find that an interesting word. So one of the things I'd like to ask you to, to talk about a bit, we, we heard from Judith, got me thinking a lot about a whole literature around educational change, which is huge. And um, I, f I find that innovation, our idea about what it is, uh, varies all over the map. Uh, come back to some things that Peter said later because they're really important. But would you like to start? And, and do you maybe have a personal idea when you when you talk about innovation? What do you mean? Mine's pretty basic. It is um, if you're making things better for kids in the classroom than they were yesterday, then I call that an innovation. And with the teachers that we've worked with, um, the mantra is try something. Try it, see if it works. If it works, great. If it doesn't, that's OK. Take a risk, and um, but always keep the kids at the center. I, I would echo that, and I would just say, we're asking our kids to take risks all the time. We need to be able to, as educators, feel free to take risks, too, and reflect on that process. Um, I would say um, innovation is falling forward. Um, we commonly in education uh, wait and sit still and try to make things perfect before we do something. And we, to, to, similar to what you guys say, is, is allowing our kids to make mistakes and take risks and fall forward and eventually you will get better and innovation is there's never a stopping point you don't innovate and then you figure it out it's like you're always moving forward so that's the fall forward piece that I, I think innovation really messages 
Yeah, I, I echo that as well. And, and part of that is sometimes failing to learn. So we need to have those failures and learn from our failures. Taking those ri the risk taking has been, uh, you know, echoed a few times here, and that um, we can learn from those failures to create something better, and that comes in that whole cycle of learning. So, an innovator, you need to be uh, somewhat prepared to accept risk and to uh, to fall forward. Hey. Do you think education, uh, in the large sense, the Colleges are not exempt. Uh, is it a is it a risk tolerant or a risk averse environment? <laughs> uh, let me answer that. <laughs> uh, risk averse, and if it was on a scale of one to ten, one being uh, not so risky and ten being risky, it'd be a one and a half. Um, uh, it, you know, in, in our industry, in, in startup world, in, in technology, we always, we talk about failing fast and, and going out and making mistakes and trying to figure this stuff out. And when I go into classrooms or, you know, talk to my kids, it's like, it's not about failing. It's about passing. And it's about getting a mark. And it's not, we can't fail, Dad. We can't do it that way because if we do it that way, well, I won't get a good mark. And it's like, well, what are you going to learn? Uh, doesn't matter. Like, my daughter did an essay two years ago about the Canadian Pacific Railway, and she said, Dad, I will get an A on this, but I can guarantee you I will not remember anything tomorrow. And to me, that, that is where we don't, we, don't, we don't allow our kids to take risk. We just tell them to get a good mark, and it kind of pisses me off, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think what... The pleasure for me in being involved with uh, Through Different Lens has been that program has amplified those pockets of innovators that have really taken those risks and tried something different and given them a safe environment to do it and then to share that. And as we've seen that, it's been like concentric circles where more innovators are together learning from each other and folks who, um, just a quick story of a prote we had a week ago that uh, Leighton helped facilitate with Judith where we had 80 teachers in the room from K to 12 and um, a board member came up to me later and said, boy, 10 years ago when I was a principal in this district, you would never see high school students or teachers working with elementary teachers talking about their practice and what they could learn from each other. So I think uh, while it has been adverse historically, there's amazing pockets uh, of innovation going on. And it's through, obviously, uh, you know, Russ's work and, and Ellen's work around this award, allowing us to amplify, put a spotlight on some of those things that are going on uh, that I really appreciate. I too think it's changing, and there is hope, and um, the way Leighton is teaching at UBCO, the way m many other people are teaching at universities, I think the whole uh, teacher inquiry, which is huge now in the province, has made a big difference where teachers learn from other teachers. Teachers are taking risks, sharing things that are not working, and trying to figure it out from there. So I think it's up to us to make that culture shift, and it's it's, it's present in many places. I want to say one more thing. I guess the challenge that I have, because you guys are educators and I'm not, the world that I live in is extremely different from when we talk about innovation and change to what the world you live in. So when I go into schools, it's like snail's pace. And the world that we live in is moving quickly and we're moving quickly. These are our jobs. Like, these are what we do. And education isn't keeping up to what we're doing. And so in order to prepare our kids, we need to move faster in education than we are today, or we will continue to lose our kids. And the high school dropout rate and the disengagement rate of our kids is, is happening faster than it is before. And, and yet we live in a world that, you know, again, ed, we're, we're just moving too fast in education. I, we just need to figure out how to speed that up and like put some fuel in it on it. And that's part of the challenge. Um, I agree that uh, uh, wholeheartedly with what you're saying, but we also do see some really positive changes in um, in di in in different thinking ways of thinking in, inside of the classrooms. And I just think that. Um, 
although we're seeing such great change in education and so many educators embracing that change and we do see these pockets of educators that are moving things forward uh, because life is moving so fast and uh, technology is moving so fast the world is moving so fast uh, it's going to be very difficult to catch up and that's uh, at this point a disservice i guess to the students we have currently is that uh, we haven't surpass that gap where our education is caught up with the needs of the students so um, that's I think we're, we're sort of in a um, we're, we're moving forward but are we moving forward fast enough is the question yeah so um, one of the things is I've I've found amongst the people that I know that are innovators and innovative projects that I've been in is that um, there are times when uh, you will feel uh, pretty lonely and there is a sense of, uh, hey, there's real risks involved in this. Um, and do you think that uh, better kinds of networks that we can build and support systems that we can build, I mean. So is one of the things about this innovation center, the original idea here was a lot of people who may be in the process of putting together startups and trying new things would bump into each other in this kind of a space. They could hang out here more often and meet each other rather than being in isolated pockets. Is that is that a is that a fair say to thing to say, Steve? Yeah, it's absolutely uh, the reason this building was built. And you know, as um, funny, I actually had lunch this week with Kevin Cardell, superintendent of. Um, SD23 here this week and he said exactly that is we need to be in this building we need to have that those conversations and we need to figure out how to make this stuff work and so it's not just a place when I said earlier um, it's not just a place where technology people come um, it's a place where community should come have those collisions have those conversations and that's again where innovation and ideas come from it's it's hanging out and maybe this will spark an idea of, hey, why don't we do this or why don't we do that? And it's like, yeah, why, why don't we do it? I mean, it's anything's a possibility. So part of what I took from Peter's presentation and I was very impressed about was, of course, that you have created a network of practice. And uh, that network of practice, if it's active, of course, will encourage people who will run into the kinds of frustrations that I know something like that. One of the things that we find about education sometimes is it's required us deeply siloed. People who timetable and the separation works to keep people in those silos. Think about. I want to uh, go to one more and Chris watch me. Give me a because I'm um, Many years ago, when we first started talking about putting um, television sets in schools, I'm old enough to remember. <laughs> so um, everybody said, you know, these television sets are going to transform education. Uh, and the first thing you know, there'll be professors flying around in airplanes, and they'll be broadcasting from the airplane to television to 14 states at a time, and they'll all have the same lecture at the same time, and how wonderful it will be. And this, surely television will bring the world into the classroom, and it will change everything. But we missed something. Television changed, didn't change the school, it changed the kid coming to the school. The kid with television wasn't the kid before television. One of my doctoral students the other day ago was doing interviews with a whole series of folks who were about to graduate from quite a rigorous program. One of his questions was about, uh, uh, just in the course of passing, do you have a desktop computer? Looked at him strangely and said, what is a desktop computer? <laughs> So here's the question. How do you think the kids today are different from the kids that were a decade before? Or, how have they or, or put it, let me put it this way. Do you think we're still imagining, we're, we're running schools for an imaginary kid? And that imaginary kid isn't the kid we've got. Um, there may be lots of differences, but I think what's the same is that kids come to us very curious, wanting to belong, needing the teacher to be there for them, particularly to establish a really strong relationship with them. 
Um, so those things I don't think have changed at all. And I think when it's authentic learning in the classroom, which is what we're trying to do, the kids are right there. They're, they're totally into it. They totally want to learn. And um, so maybe they've changed a lot in some ways, but I think basically they have the same needs that we had when we were in school. Um, I would agree. Um, you said one thing is they come to school to learn and uh, and I don't think that's changed. Uh, and the other thing I don't think has changed is when they leave school, they don't want to, they're, they're not there to learn. We rip the curiosity out of them. And uh, that's one thing that I think has has not changed about school. And, uh, and but uh, talking about innovation, that is the part that if we can innovate through that and create cur continue the curiosity and the engagement that we will create great community members as you know Russ talked about uh, with us earlier out in the hall, it's what, why are you there? Why are you in school? Like why, pe pe people don't know how to answer that question. And so I would say, you know, if I asked my mom or my grandma or you know my daughter, uh, they would probably all have similar answers, and the answer would be, I don't know, because we have to. And uh, versus um, you know being engaged community members and contributing to to what it is um, we need to do to create great community people. I love today's students. Uh, they they're so curious and they take charge of their own learning. And they have access to all the information we could, would gladly impart on them. But they, ha they have access to that knowledge already. And we have students that are going online and doing these MOOCs and online courses or watching YouTube videos and learning how to program and code. And we have kids that are in high school that can code better than some of these students I see coming out of uh, engineering programs. You know, these kids have written apps. They've developed um, software already in high school. And, and so I think, in a way, you know, they, they're not ready for us to stand and deliver them education we need to approach it differently they'll they'll find the knowledge they need to solve problems we need to approach education in a different way that we're um, giving them challenges and critical thinking opportunities and problems to solve because the knowledge that they need to solve those problems they're going to find on their own and I think that's what's changed um, with students and that model of our education system where we have someone standing and delivering that knowledge is just not really practical for them and we need to change that it, it's it's um sorry it's just <laughs> think a lot about this stuff um you're right is you know 10 years ago we didn't well the internet was around but it really wasn't around and now we have the ability to have the internet and my kid can google or even talk into his phone and dictate a essay if he wanted to it doesn't really you know that's not really needed and uh, to do some of the things that we used to do and I watched a uh, there's a, a video I saw on Facebook of the uh, the founder of Alibaba uh, um, company in, in China and he said if we're teaching our kids what they can already Google or know where, or what a computer can tell them we're teaching them the wrong things and we shouldn't be focusing on that and I think that's a lot of what's changed over the last about 10 years is the thinking of, you know, do we really need to teach our kids these things? Because if, if we don't, we have, you know, a lot of stuff we need to change. But we are starting to think about that and doing that here in this province anyways, because uh, we're, be, we're far ahead of what the state of Texas or Kentucky is doing, I can tell you that. Yes. Any further comments from the panel about that? I would just add, I think that some of that the positive pieces that we're seeing is putting learners at the center uh, and having them own their learning more has been has been really powerful so while students may have changed we've changed as well as adults as we've been embraced by technology you know um, so I think we have to recognize that that we're learning as well we're co-learners with our kids through and, and a lot of this is uncharted territory for us because of the exponential rate of change and you talked about how it's tough because schools aren't keeping up um, it's tough for us to keep up, even just you know, as a parent, for me to keep up on what's the right amount of time for my 
my daughter to be on that phone at night. So I think we all share that experience. And as we co-learn with kids and have them at the center, and then ask them those questions through inquiry um, around what are you learning today and, and why is it important to you? And we know uh, Judy and Linda through Spirals of Inquiry have done a lot of great work, uh, as have others. I think that really grounds the conversations around keeping kids owning their learning and what's important to them. So lots of work to be done, but lots of promising practice that's happening right now. Sorry. I have a closing comment. <laughs> One of the reasons this building was built and why we're here is because, you know, we're all different parts of the community. We're educators, we're entrepreneurs, we're whatever, uh, you know, post-secondary. It's like we should take, so again, nobody's going to do this for us. And we need to take the opportunity, like look at the people in the room and say, like, how are we going to do this together? What I find often is K-12 and post-secondary never get together. They don't talk. And then, and then also, you know, the, the business world is kind of out there. We don't talk to them. And we need to talk to each other more. And we need to hang out more. And we need to have these conversations more. Because, you know, a, a lot of what we're talking about here, I, th I hear all the time. But we, it's like we have to wait to get on a panel to have these conversations and we shouldn't be doing that. This should be, this should be every single day. This is our kids we're talking about. And, and if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And, and so I think that's where entrepreneurship, you know, innovation really needs to happen is those three networks of K-12, post-secondary and, uh, and, 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 and business need to come together a lot more often. In fact, one of our visions for this session was that it would be a conversation get people together who sometimes don't meet each other. And I know how divided the valley can be, right? How often do people in Penticton? So breaking down those silos and encouraging people to uh, cross over and get a chance to talk, it makes a huge difference. There's no question about it. Um, yes, I think that I think that um, the Smolik Prize has been a fantastic incentive um, to us to consider some of the things that we can do together. And in meetings out in the foyer here, I talked to a number of people that I've known for a while. And um, it comes to me that Simon Fraser actually has a rather unique tradition. Many years ago, when computers lived in the basements of the administration buildings, as IBM 35070s, Simon Fraser was early days in terms of what was then not even called the internet, and we didn't have the World Wide Web as such. But we could connect teachers, talk to each other on this wonderful thing called Star Forum, which was about the kludgiest possible computer. But we gave away 1,400 IDs to that session. And we had people on there who were people like Dr. Fish, who's in the room here, who would answer questions from teachers anywhere in the province that they wanted to know about salmon spawning and things like that. We had Dr. Spider and Dr. Bones and other people. When we finally decided we didn't need it anymore and we shut it down, we printed out 140,000 pages of interactions among the people. I wish we, we, we have all the email and the Facebook and all the social media, but sometimes I think we really aren't connecting to the level that we could. We have a tradition in that. Maybe we can do it again. Peter's already 400. Well, 400 teachers in there, Peter. That's a triumph. Thanks. Thank invite you out of the spotlight, uh, but really appreciate you taking time to uh, share some of your thoughts uh, with us tonight. Uh, apparently, I've been told that no educational gathering is complete without a Dewey quote, and so I offer you this from Dewey, um, and it wasn't in my book of words, but listening to to our panel talk tonight uh, reminded what Nui said that every 
great advance in science issues forth from a new audacity of imagination. And I think everybody here has had an audacity of imagination. And the challenge, I think, that we have, and one of the things that I so value uh, about the Smollett Prize in putting a spotlight on some of these audacious, imaginative, courageous innovations uh, is that we not only do a better job of, of celebrating all this good work, but when we do so, we find ways to ensure that the spirit of educational innovation, of excellence, and at the heart of all of that, and I, I heard that in every single voice, compassion thrives here. So thank you so much for the panel. Thank you to uh, Milt for, for leading that. Uh, Thank you to Peter for offering words of, uh, of inspiration and the work that you've been doing. A uh, reminder that at this time next year, we'll be announcing the 2019 Smollett Prize winner. Please uh, spread the word. If you're seeing innovation happening, if you're engaging in innovation, please uh, uh, do, do take part. Uh, we'll be kicking off that campaign formally in October with a similar um, uh, event in Victoria. The uh, event will be on October 18th, and the 2016 winner, Kieran Egan, will be the featured speaker, and we are all invited to attend. I think the challenge that we've been laid with tonight is simply how might we engage together more often and break down the silos. Uh, as much as we talk about innovation, I think the heart of education is exactly the same as it's always been. And so we'll go back a few years, even earlier than Dewey, if you can imagine, and share something from Socrates. Wisdom begins in wonder. Our job as educators is to never, ever let kids lose that sense of wonder. And if we can do that, we will have collective wisdom. The method that Socrates used to incur that wisdom was dialogue. So it's through dialogue that wisdom can occur, that you put together wonder with practicality, and then you make it happen. So in closing, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight, thank all of our special guests. Uh, we had an amazing team uh, putting all of this together in the fact of education. So wave, you guys were just absolutely wonderful. We would hope that you have, a, have some time yet to get inspired by these conversations and to carry them on out there. Uh, we'll keep the, uh, the wine flowing uh, so that those conversations get even more intriguing and more interesting <laughs> and even more possible. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.